so uh, my name is Ethan Marcotte. I'm Beep on Twitter if you want a treasure trove of pointless gifts and dumb things said online. I'd like to start today with a story specifically about a map because I think it's actually kind of relevant to the web today, even though this story takes place a few hundred years ago. So what we're going to talk about first is about New York City at the turn of the 19th century, which is a very different place. And specifically, we're going to talk about the man who made this map, a man named John Randell Jr. Now, we don't actually know much about Mr. Randell. I feel like I can tell you guys that. We know that he was born in Albany, New York, sometime in the last years of, uh, the, of the 18th century. What we do know, however, is that he eventually became one of New York City's three street commissioners. And for us, this is actually where his story really becomes interesting. Because in the last years of the 1700s, New York City was a fraction of its modern day size. Its population was around 125,000 people, according to the estimates that we have around the time. Probably doesn't seem like very much to you and I. But the amazing thing, or maybe the terrifying thing, is that the overwhelming percentage of that population was actually concentrated around the southernmost tip of the island, all huddled around a really small part of New York City's 33 and a half square miles. North of that point, however, there were these privately held expansive estates that sprawled for miles on end. So kind of in a lot of ways, we're not talking about one New York City, but two. Two cities sitting side by side, not really overlapping all that much on the same exact island. And what's more, due to a recent surge of immigration around this time period, that southernmost tip of the island, the most heavily populated part of the city, was actually proving unsafe and unsustainable. I mean, living conditions were almost squalid. It was proving really difficult for the city to provide reliable fire control, to police the area effectively or well. Even preventing the spread of disease was a daily challenge. Now, thankfully, city government felt like this was maybe a solvable problem. So after a few failed initiatives, in 1807, they formed what was known as the Commission of Streets and Roads to try to design and, uh, and build a new comprehensive street plan for the island. And they appointed our good friend from a few slides ago, John Randall Jr., its chief engineer and surveyor. Now, Randell had this team of really talented folks working alongside him, but there's a lot of really great writing around this time about how Randell himself was often seen walking the entire length of the island, from south to north and then back again, sometimes twice in one day. And as he walked, he'd actually plant these posts in the ground behind him to actually denote where an intersection would eventually fall. And after four years of this work, four years of this hard work, he and his team finally completed their project. And what they produced, I think, was actually kind of beautiful. Because they produced three copies of a map. Each one of those maps was nine feet long and 30 inches wide, each one of them detailing New York City's now famous grid street layout. And I mean, the aesthetics of these maps are, are one thing, but the scope of what they designed is stunning because they basically produced a system of 12 named or lettered streets running north-south parallel to the island, each one of them intersected by 155 numbered streets crossing them east to west. So in a lot of ways, what Randell and his team had done was they'd taken this jumble of irregularly shaped plots of land and knotted streets and normalized them. They created a kind of life-size Cartesian coordinate system that was accessible both to old residents of the island and new ones alike. This is a talk about web design. Uh, <laughs> but the reason I'm excited to be here today and share this story with you guys isn't just because I love the details, but I think there's a magic to map making. You know, maps provide a sense of boundary and scope. They give a shape to something we didn't previously understand. So we can explore territory that's completely foreign to us. And when we do so, we, we chart down what we learn, right? We try to understand its landmarks and their relationships to each other. And then we create this artifact, this map, this globe, that we can then bring back into that territory that was once so foreign to us and make it feel a little bit more like home. There's an analogy here between maps and map making and the work that we do on the web on a daily basis. I mean, every single project that we launch, every site that we design and build is like a little map that we make of a problem we didn't previously understand. We try to figure out where, where its contours are and try to understand the scope of it. And then when we launch it, well, we've you know, sort of explained it. We've created that artifact, that map of that problem space to make it more accessible both to us and our businesses, but also to our audiences as well. And if we take every single one of those maps and we sort of stack them on top of each other or stitch them together, we're basically, on a daily basis, building a map of the web together in our work, if you think about it. 
The problem is, is that our map of the web has historically been kind of narrow or maybe a little bit limited in scope because we've been so focused historically on just a handful of desktop browsers and devices and basically just building sites and experiences tailored just for them. And then as the saying goes, mobile more or less broke the hell out of everything. <laughs> the thing is, is that mobile didn't really break anything. It just showed us that the way in which we viewed the web was entirely too narrow. It was a little bit of a consensual hallucination as Jeremy Keith likes to call it, one that we'd all bought into, that we could somehow control where and when people access our sites and our services. But now we're keenly aware of that fact that you know, our audiences are trying to access our work everywhere and every when they happen to be, regardless of the size of the screen that happens to be close to, to them. And we've been trying to bring our work closer to them, first with device-specific experiences, and now with more device-agnostic, more holistic ones. Well, one of those happens to be something called responsive web design. This is an article I wrote, uh, oh god, five years ago. I'm just going to have a sad moment for a minute about the passage of time. Uh, but I mean, responsive design at the end of the day, I mean, you, if you put aside the technical components, it's about embracing the flexibility intrinsic to the web. You know, Christian talked a lot this morning about access and maintainability. The web is the first truly flexible design medium. There's really never been anything like it before. And flex, uh, things like responsive design allow us to leverage that flexibility and design across a greater number of screens than ever before. And I'm talking to you guys right now, but I'm terrified of it because I didn't expect to be the guy talking about responsive design five years on. I mean, I hit a publishing deadline, I shipped an article, and I wasn't expecting anything like the reception that it got. I mean, I'm sure everyone in this room has worked with some sort of responsive experience, but it's been terrifying to me to see designers and brands and businesses and publications that I deeply respect and admire Take those simple little ingredients from a responsive design article that I wrote and do things with them that I think are kind of breathtaking. But what I love about it isn't just the flexibility of the layouts, but a lot of these organizations are finding that responsive design changes the way that they work and collaborate internally. The way in which they think about and design information hierarchies gets really interesting when you start thinking more flexibly. Even something as simple as buying and managing ads on your website gets much more complicated when you stop thinking about a mobile experience, a tablet experience, and a desktop experience, and you just start thinking about your online home as just the web. Now, that's not to say that responsive design is the answer for every project. I'm the first person to tell you that it's not, but I think it's another tool in the box. And with it, we're actually starting to build a better map of what happens beyond the desktop on the web today. So if every little project that we work on is like a map, I want to tell you about one little journey that I went on a couple years ago, working on a responsive web application uh, called Editorially. Did anyone happen to use Editorially in its brief lifetime? OK. Well, there's a one hand up in the back of the room. This is something I miss daily. But um, Editorially closed its doors at the uh, beginning of last year. But it was still a really fun project to work on. So I thought I'd share a little bit about how responsive design works if you haven't worked on one, and walk you through the interface right now. So just as a little bit of preamble, I mean, Editorially was a service for writers and editors to work better together online. The Editorially team basically felt that the best writing process wasn't about bringing word processors into browsers, but actually trying to build some tooling around the collaboration process. So people could, in this completely responsive interface, build uh, documents and publish them and actually share them with other people in a versioned environment and basically work on any size screen that happened to be close at hand. Now, most of that uh, collaboration happened in the editor, which was kind of a rich writing experience. But the approach that I really liked the editorial team took was that it wasn't about presentation. It was about structure. So you could use something like Markdown to basically treat your text as a kind of interface. So that as you sort of decorated it, it would actually just sort of enhance the presentation just a little bit to better communicate a sense of structure in the document. But because the team actually believed really strongly in the flexibility of the web, and the access that the platform provided, they didn't want to sort of limit the functionality just to wider screens. They really wanted this to be a completely responsive experience. So no matter what device you happen to have closest to you, you would have this fully featured experience so you could access your words and revise them and still collaborate with other people side by side. Sorry, it's the end of the day. I'm soapboxing at you. But <laughs> you know, because uh, Editorially was a completely responsive experience, there are really just three ingredients that go into any responsive design. It begins first with a flexible or fluid grid-based layout, with images and media that work within those flexible designs, and then finally media queries that allow us to articulate how those flexible, sprawling layouts can actually be reshaped in useful ways so that we can make major or minor changes to those kind of ugly, flexible grids. 
Now, there aren't a lot of images in the editorial UI, but I just wanted to go over the, three, uh, the two workhorse ingredients, specifically fluid grids and media queries working together and show you how they work or how I think about them working. So there's been a lot of writing, both by me and by other people, about how you can take any grid system that's been designed in something like Photoshop and Illustrator and translate it into something more proportional. Using a little bit of proportional math, we can take target pixel values from a comp or some sort of mock-up, and by assessing their width relative to the container that they sit in, we're left with a proportional result that is probably the ugliest numbers you guys have seen today. Uh, although I'm talking to a room full of programmers, and I barely understand numbers. So uh, uh, anyway. We can take that number and basically drop it directly into our style sheet. The nice thing about this math is it applies to pretty much every component of our designs, even the gutters that separate elements on the grid. I mean, those have target pixel values that might be articulated in Photoshop or in Illustrator. But we can actually express them relative to the same exact container, and we're left with a result that's you know, roughly 3%, and then a whole bunch of paint after the decimal point. And rather than rounding those numbers off, I mean, we can actually just take them and drop them directly into our style sheet, apply some directional rules, and we're left with the flexibility that we need to get this working in a cross-device context. Unfortunately, that's not you know, all that happens. There's always cleanup that happens in any layout, and that's why I've been leaning a little bit more on tools like Nthchild to really round off some of the details of my responsive designs. Um, I'm sure everyone in the room is probably familiar with this pseudo selector, but if you're not, um, this is something I've really started pushing, especially on more complex layouts like editorialies. So I can directly address individual elements of my design without cluttering up the markup with presentational classes. So for example, I could say something like doc cell and child 2 to directly address some styles to that cell that happens to be the second child of its parent. That's totally useless. Where nth child gets really powerful and really interesting, however, is when you start bringing some letters into the mix, specifically n. So if I say 2n, then basically every even-numbered cell I can address with that one simple rule. And this works if I have 20 cells in the grid or 20,000. Now, for this layout, that's not very helpful. But the reason this works is because n is essentially a counter. It starts from 0 and increments by 1 each time. So then it's simple multiplication. 2 times 0, 2 times 1, 2 times 2, and so on and so forth. So if I'm building this three-column layout, then I can say something like this, nth child 3n to basically remove that right-hand margin on every single third cell in my grid to ensure that it's flush against the right-hand edge of my layout. But I can also say nth child 3n to select every third cell, but this time starting from 1 rather than 0. And when I do that, I can basically clear all the floats preceding it to ensure that every single row has a nice discrete grouping of three cells on each line. So this is actually where that flexibility comes into play, because without actually having to describe my layout in the markup, I've got a quick three-column grid. And it's founded on some proportional layouts rather than pixel-specific ones. So the pixel values of those elements will change over time as the viewport gets wider or smaller. But the proportions that were originally designed remain intact. Now, there's a reason that flexible layouts have had a bad rap for years, but this is where media queries come in. We can actually channel that flexibility in useful ways without actually getting overwhelmed by it. So every responsive design that I've worked on since the Boston Globe has started with this sort of baseline layout. You know, it's a single column of tasks. There's actually not much of a grid to speak of. They're basically just sorted from top to bottom. It's mobile friendly by default. But basically, with this flexible single column layout in place, we can start widening the viewport a little bit more and looking for opportunities to enhance it. So for example, at a width of around 31 m's, I can introduce a breakpoint where I move to a two column cell in the body using uh, nth child 2n and 2n plus 1. And I can also promote a few more elements up into the header using some simple absolute positioning. And then I can repeat the process. You know, when I get up to a width of around 44 m's, I can go to that three column layout we just built a few slides ago with 3n and 3n plus 1 in the nth child. And then, again, I can kind of repeat the process. I can narrow the header because we have a little bit more room to work with, and I can move to a four-column layout with nth child 4n and 4n plus 1. I think you can see where this is probably going. I haven't actually described in the HTML or in the document anything about the layout that I want. I've abstracted all those rules into my CSS so I can move to a five-column layout or a six-column layout if I'm feeling especially, you know, self-masochistic, uh, <laughs> and then move up to a six column and a seven column and so on. We're at this point now where we can build grid systems that are effectively infinite. You know, responsive design for me isn't about taking a desktop-friendly design and sizing it down to mobile, although that's definitely a nice benefit. We can basically create a design that doesn't have any one true canonical best version. You know, we can think about devices that we have at hand and build experiences that look great on the smallest screen, 
as well as the widest one possible. And as I've been doing more of this work and moving more and more of my layout rules out of my documents, it's been really helpful for me to move away from this idea of a page, right? That there's no, this, there's no holistic, tightly bound thing that controls my interface. Instead, what we're actually doing these days is designing a network of small layout systems, individual components and small little responsive UIs that can actually adapt according to their own rules, but then they're eventually uh, loosely bound to the other small layout systems that happen to be around them. Quick example. I'll show you the, uh, the masthead that appeared inside of editorially. Now at the wider viewport, this looks like a fairly traditional toolbar, right? There's some key text in the middle and then maybe some important functionality on the left or on the right. But that's just one view of this small layout system. Because as that design actually adapts, below a certain point, just the masthead simplifies itself. It goes from that toolbar looking presentation just down to a list of five or six links. The functionality and the content is exactly the same between both views, but the, uh, the interaction model and the layout have both changed across those two breakpoints, or across that one breakpoint. So the design for this, we kind of had to settle on. It started as kind of a desktop only approach, so we kind of had to vet how this was gonna work on a small screen UI. And I do this process with anything that I'm building. I try to take a look, not at the layout, but the tasks that I'm actually designing. And so for this masthead, I basically just took all the individual elements and I sorted them into logical groups that could be presented on a small screen. You know, so basically grouping those links and those pieces of information into buckets that I could then move around the UI as I had a little bit more room to play with. So once I'd done that sorting, I could then basically introduce a breakpoint. So once I got above a width of around 50 Ms, I could basically take those buckets and just shuttle them off to the left or off to the right-hand side of the design, depending on what, uh, you know, once I had a little bit more room to work with. But it's not just about moving elements around the UI. We can also look for opportunities to make better use of the space available to us in these small layout systems. So for example, elements that appear in submenus by default on the smaller screen, we can use absolute positioning to actually just drape them over the middle of that toolbar to make them visible by default when we have enough room to work with them. Now, when people are looking at my CSS, well, the first question they usually ask is, why, God, did you do this? Um, but the one question that comes up a lot is, you know, these breakpoints, where do they actually come from? This isn't tailored to a specific screen resolution or a device class. That's actually driven by the needs of this one small layout system, of the content that appears inside that masthead. Because below that point, that central piece of information inside that toolbar, that document text, actually becomes in danger of being clipped by the buttons that appear on the left or on the right. So that makes a natural falling off point to simplify the layout to ensure that the content's still accessible and still easy to read, regardless of the size of the screen. So in general, if you can design your media queries, and specifically your breakpoints, around defending your content, defending the integrity of your content, don't focus on device classes or screen shapes, but rather just looks at, look at the needs of the content inside those small layout systems to build more future-friendly layouts from there. I think uh, a really beautiful example of this is Microsoft's responsive homepage. And I, I fully acknowledge that I'm in a weird point in my career where I'm praising design work coming out of Microsoft. <laughs> but this is one of the most stunning responsive designs that I've seen. I mean, if you spend any amount of time with this layout, every single module on the homepage feels tuned to its ideal width and height. So you'll see elements like that discover menu that appears on the left on wider breakpoints. It, you know, at certain breakpoints, it'll actually move to a horizontal list of links and then sometimes back to a vertical one. It's not just a one-way upgrade. They're always looking at the needs of those small layout systems and adapting the layout accordingly to ensure that it's always a pleasure to read and interact with on any size viewport. The reason I love this more content out view of design is that we can't keep up with the devices that keep emerging in the marketplace. We have to focus on the needs of the information we're designing rather than the screens in front of us. And to do so, we can basically then build this map of the web together, right? We're moving further and further beyond the desktop. The devices we have on hand today didn't exist five months ago. And that's always gonna be the case of the web. And so we're filling in this new medium with landmarks and this new territory that we're still trying to figure out today. It's kind of an exciting time. But the thing is, our work is really only just beginning. And our map is, in fact, pretty far from complete. There's been a lot of writing about the benefits of adopting responsive design, which has been really amazing to see, about businesses that have been talking pretty vocally about why responsive design has actually helped them. You know, three examples that kind of come quickly to mind would be the Boston Globe, who I had the pleasure of working with a few years ago. 
and then two e-commerce sites, O'NeillClothing.com, who actually just recently redesigned, and then SkinnyTies.com. I love that name. <laughs> so the Boston Globe basically said that after we launched that responsive layout, they found that digital subscription scales spiked by almost 50% in the first six months after launch, which was really great to see. The folks at uh, O'Neill Clothing, Electric Pulp, who was the studio behind it, basically said that iPhone transactions more than doubled and Android transactions more than quadrupled over the previous non-responsive version of the site. Skinny Ties also found that it wasn't just about mobile versus desktop. Pretty much every single class of device that hit the new responsive experience saw improved revenue growth, visit duration, and conversion rate on pretty much every browser, regardless of device class, that hit the new responsive shopping experience. I love slides like this, you know, especially not just in conference settings, but I like to show impressive looking percentages to clients and stakeholders and actually say that there's some value from a business standpoint in adopting responsive design. But I think it's also fair to say that there's been a little muttering in the underbrush, that maybe responsive design's not all that. And in fact, maybe there's a little bit of trouble in paradise that we need to talk about. Always lead with a GIF, Mom said. She didn't actually say that. Um, <laughs> Quick example, uh, this is moto.oakley.com. This is, a, frankly, a beautiful piece of responsive work. It's one of the most technically impressive responsive sites I've seen in a while. It's a completely responsive design, but they've done an amazing job translating some very complex layout and animation schemes on this completely flexible canvas. It is a single page website, and on a non-retina screen, it weighs about six megabytes. Now, to be fair, credit where credit's due, when they first launched, uh, it was closer to 85 megabytes. So they've optimized the absolute, <laughs> they have optimized the absolute heck out of this. So for something that wasn't designed with performance in mind, maybe, you know, this is actually impressive work, I think. This is TNNLax.com, um, a sadly now defunct digital design studio up in Canada, but their site was wonderful. I don't know if anyone here happened to see it, but not just from an aesthetic standpoint or from a layout standpoint, but they told amazing stories about the client work that they did. And there were all these wonderful little interaction details kind of throughout the UI. So, you know, if you happen to have a mouse available to you on the device that you were using, you could move into certain graphics and actually scrub them with your mouse to actually get a little bit more detail about their process and their thinking, the before and after of some of this work. It was a beautiful piece of responsive design. But depending on where you were in the site, any given page would range in size from 3 megabytes to 21 megabytes. So it's sites like teenandlax.com and moto.oakley.com that have led some people to say things like this. I think you have to face the music. Responsive design makes it hard to write a fast website. Them's fighting words, guys. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> after, the, you know, after the party time, we'll grab some por uh, you know, pitchforks and torches. It's going to be a really great evening. Um, I, I'm just kidding. I mean, Guy Pajarni, actually, he's a former CTO at Akamai, and he's done some invaluable research and writing into some of the challenges facing responsive designers who should be caring about performance, as I think we probably all do. But this is a sentiment that comes up pretty frequently, that at the end of the day, there's something about responsive design that makes it incompatible with front-end performance. And I'm here to tell you that's not the case. But there is that larger problem with performance, as Nicholas wonderfully put together today. But it extends beyond responsive design. Here's, uh, here's one little publication that's uh, doing some great work on the web. I'm excited to see what they can do. Um, this is a, a previous version of the redesign, which was not flexible or responsive. It was a completely fixed width design. And for such a stately looking design, I was actually kind of dis uh, surprised to discover that it weighed about three megabytes before the ad showed up and ruined the party even more. This is another fixed width site. Uh, this is internet.org. This one's actually kind of interesting. This is a campaign put together by Facebook to help people in developing markets get better access to Facebook. I'm sorry, I meant the internet. <laughs> But on a non-retina screen, this single page weighs 4.3 megabytes. This is Apple's Mac Pro promo site. And you know, this is stunning work. I mean, this is cinematic. It's beautiful. I mean, you, know, you have artwork that's sort of flying out of the darkness at you. And yeah, it's a scroll jacking thing. But you, know, I mean, you, know, you have photographs that turn into cross sections of themselves. I mean, this is, this is evocative work, you know, unsurprising given who designed it. This one page on a non-retina screen weighed 33.4 megabytes. So, you know, standing in front of a room for, full of wonderful people, I, it would be very easy for me to look at the New York Times or Apple's promo sites or internet.org and to basically say that, guys, I think we need to face the music. 
fixed width design makes it very hard <laughs> to write a fast website. I'm officially trolling. So what I'm doing is what some of the critics of responsive design have done, which is they're looking at specific implementations that maybe weren't engineered or designed as effectively as they could be, and use them to critique the, uh, the approach as a whole. So there's nothing at the end of the day about responsive design that makes it slow. It's the people and the design work that goes into it that actually determines the quality of the product. But there is, as we've heard at many points today, a larger weight problem on the web. I mean, back in 2009, the average size of a web page was 320 kilobytes. And as of this month, this year, that size has gone up to 2.1 megabytes. Every single year, the weight of our work seems to double. It's 600% growth almost in about six years. And Moore's Law has been charting all these wonderful increases in nearly every aspect of personal computing, faster processors, expanded storage, better memory. But the one area Moore's Law has completely failed is bandwidth. And that trend doesn't seem to be reversing itself. So as I was uh, working on this talk, I came across the work of this philosopher and this writer named Alfred Korzybski, who was working in the middle of the 20th century. And he was, a, he was a philosopher, but he was also really focused on this idea of semantics, of the words that we use to actually communicate on a daily basis. A uh, quick example, he loved this idea of what was known as a rhetorical divide between a concept and a representation of it. So for example, I could basically ask you to tell me about that first cup of coffee you had this morning, or tea, that's more your thing. This is a safe place. No judgment. You know, tell me about that experience. Tell me what it was like. I mean, you could start anywhere. You could start with the taste of it, the smell, the heat in your hands. It doesn't really matter. You could talk quite literally for days about that experience, drinking that coffee or that tea. And some detail would always be left out. So for me, the listener, language is never going to be able to bridge that gap between the actual experience of drinking the coffee and the re representation you're actually painting with your words. And this is what fascinated Korzybski. This is what led him to basically say that the map, the thing, or the, uh, the representation is not actually the territory, the thing that it represents. So basically, this seems, I think, a little bit self-evident, right? That when you're actually looking at a map, you're not looking at the territory that it represents, right? You're looking at an abstraction, you know, of three dimensions that have basically been blunted down into two. Something is going to get left out, right? But Korzybski was actually concerned that we overlooked that distinction. Sometimes we'd actually mentally substitute the map for the territory. We'd be so focused on the drawing in front of us that we wouldn't sometimes look up to take in the complexity and the terrifying chaos of the territory that it actually represented. I mention this because I think in a lot of ways as an industry, we tend to do this on the web on a daily basis that um, a majority of our design discussions and the, you know, discussions around responsive design specifically focus on decidedly Western views of the web. And in many ways, we've mistaken the map for the true territory of the web, which is actually much more complicated and much more chaotic than we might like to admit. Quick example, you know, the word that I think I hear most on any given responsive design is probably mobile, <coughs> right? And mobile, I think we've, we've actually done a good job of sort of redefining it in recent years. There's no singular mobile user. But we still have a little bit of conceptual baggage. We think of these devices that are always on, they're always online, they're my device. They're the truly personal computer. But if we look a little bit further afield, the picture is much more complicated than that. This is Dhaka, the capital city of Bangladesh. And this is a fascinating part of the world to me. I would love to visit it at some point. Because Dhaka is actually classified as a megacity one that both has an incredibly large population and a very, very high population density. Among many other reasons, Dhaka is actually known for its uh, density because over a relatively small area, there are over 115,000 people for every square mile of the city. Uh, back in 2012, uh, The Economist actually ranked it the sixth most unlivable city on the planet. But it's actually a really fascinating area of the world because mobile usage is incredibly widespread. In 2011 alone, the number of mobile users in the country exploded by over 900%, thanks to some massive deregulation. And even among the poorest citizens of urban areas like Dhaka, mobile usage is incredibly widespread, but these are very rarely personal devices. There are all these pocket economies of sidewalk vendors who rent time and data to people who want access to the web, but can't actually afford the data and the devices themselves. And this isn't just uh, isolated to Bangladesh. I mean, if we look a little bit further west and move over to Africa, I mean, things are seriously afoot in the continent. 
<coughs> I mean, the continent, they have more than 700 million mobile phone users, outpacing pretty much anything that we have here in the West. And nearly a tenth of Africa's landmass is actually covered with mobile internet services. In fact, it's often said that there are more people in Africa who have access to a mobile phone than direct access to electricity, which I think is really wonderful. But despite that, or maybe because of it, in many ways, Africa is actually leapfrogging our definition of the web because they haven't historically been yoked to the desktop for so long. I mean, more advertising monies are actually poured into mobile than any other medium. And uh, mobile payment systems are actually far further ahead than anything we happen to have here in the West. But once again, their version of mobile doesn't neatly map to ours. Uh, mobile phones are, again, not often personal devices. They might be leased, as in Bangladesh, or they might actually be shared among a community or a village. Now, this is changing, of course, but that means that their definition of mobile is dramatically different than ours. In fact, their definition of the web is much different than ours. Some of the most uh, popular services in sub-Saharan Africa are things like Hatari, which allows you to report bribes and corruption by email, by text, or by tweet. And then there's Mimi Board, which allows people to actually uh, create these geospecific notice boards of things and events near them, like lunch specials or traffic collisions, stuff like that. And then there's M Maji, which is a really wonderful service. It means mobile water in Swahili. And using a very simple SMS-driven interface, Nairobians without access to clean water can actually compare water vendors, compare prices, all without leaving their homes, and rate their service after they've completed a transaction. Now, looking at each of these services, I mean, they don't seem to have a lot in common. I mean, they're designed with a whole host of different services and protocols, but the one characteristic they all share is that they're designed for reach from the outset. And this is by far and wide emblematic of the most popular services in Africa. They start with the lowest tier of devices possible and then intelligently enhance up to the highest end. Now, I know what you're thinking. You know, it's the end of the day. Maybe there are a couple crossed arms. Or maybe you're really excited about some drinks tonight. And maybe you're thinking to yourselves, though, that these aren't my users. These aren't the people that I'm designing for today. But I'd actually argue that in the very short term, they might be. Or they might be closer to the profile of the people that you're actually designing for. I mean, geographically speaking, there's been a lot of really interesting research about the changing shape of the web as it's happening right now today, that the lion's share of mobile data isn't actually being consumed in more developed markets anymore. It's actually being consumed in more developing, more emerging economies. But you know, putting geography aside, the network that we use to publish our work and travel the web on a daily basis is far more volatile and far slower than we might like to think. Ericsson recently found that of the 7 billion estimated mobile subscriptions that were in use at the end of 2013, a full 60% of them were on sub 3G networks. And this is expected to change, and the trend is starting to adjust itself, but there's still some expectations, again, from Ericsson, that by the end of 2017, a full 36% of our users will still be on edge or CDMA quality networks. And I know if 36% of our users were still on IE6, we would be having a much more somber and much different discussion today. <laughs> Google even says that it's important to focus on 3G load times from a design perspective, because even though we have 4G now, those users are on 3G or worse a lot of the time, nearly a quarter of the time in the United States and half the time in large parts of Europe. So I think what's happening is a really interesting disconnect in how we think about design and development for the web. We are, today, building some of the most beautiful, some of the most stunning responsive work or non-responsive work that happens to be out on the web at any point in its short history. But I wonder if maybe it's not ready for a web that's increasingly dominated by slow connections, by low-powered devices, that's not ready for the web as it's redefining itself right now. And so at least for me, I, I think it's easy, at least for me personally, to kind of write off the developments in some of these younger markets like Bangladesh or Sub-Saharan Africa is just kind of like, you know, that's, a, that's an emerging ecosystem. Eventually all boats will rise. But I think what's actually happening is emblematic of a new normal for the web. That this class of user in, this, you know, in these regions are actually more representative of the people we're designing for on a daily basis. So if that's true, if the web is much slower than we'd like to think of, what does that mean for how we design and build for the web? And are we ready for them? Well, there's one story I did want to come back to, which is that story about John Randell and his map of New York, because I think there's some interesting parallels between New York City at the end of the 1800s and the web as it existed today. Because you had, basically, this large population consolidated at the foot of the island, but this was really representative of future growth for the city. 
And then north of that point, you had the entrenched interests, the private estates, the wealthy few who were actually able to enjoy life on the planet. And Randell's work had to sit in the middle of them. He actually had to plan for balance between these two seemingly competing interests. He was trying to design for balance and for future prosperity for all citizens of the city. Now, if you think about maps, just in general, I mean, you usually think about them as the result of a documentation effort, right? You explore that territory, you write down what you know. But Randell's map was for a territory that didn't actually exist. He was trying to define a vision for New York City as it could be, a better version of the city that didn't actually exist at that time. There's actually a really wonderful line from their mission statement, where they were basically tasked to lay out streets and um, in such a manner as to unite regularity and order with the public convenience and benefit, and in particular, to promote the health of the city. And you don't see a lot of poetry in civic documentation, but I love that line. And I wonder if we should be asking ourselves on a more daily basis, in everything that we do, how can we better promote the health of the web? Not just planning for the users and the devices that we happen to know about today, but for future growth that we can't really anticipate. And I think responsive design is a start, but we need to move beyond just adapting for different size screens. In general, I think what we're doing today in talking about some of the first principles that Christian highlighted is we're talking about sustainability, planning not just for device sizes and viewports, but also for the classes of users and networks that we may not be designing for today. So anyway, when I think about sustainability, there are really kind of these two underlying concepts we need to reduce and revisit. And reduction is the one that we often think about when we think about front-end performance. Um, you know, and there's been so many organizations talking about the commercial benefits of building faster, more lightweight experiences. Walmart is a really great example of this, where they basically found that there was a sharp decline in conversion rate as average site load time increased from even just one to four seconds. That's why many people in the performance community basically say that if it takes more than a second to load, it's frequently broken for both you and for your uh, users. Now, Nicholas outlined some of my favorite tools for designing more res uh, responsibly with an eye toward performance. Web page test is an invaluable design tool. But the one that he mentioned that I really love is defining a performance budget. And this is something I try to do with all of my clients and stakeholders at the very beginning of a project, before prototyping's even begun. Because it's a great way to get your team focused on uh, performance as a design principle, rather than something that needs to be tackled from a technical standpoint at the end. And performance budgets, I mean, they can be defined in any number of ways. I mean, originally they started really around like requests or page size. More frequently, I think most organizations are talking in terms of user experience, so time to first byte, or how quickly pages load over certain network connections. But regardless of how you actually define your budget as a team, it's important to vet every single decision, from content to design to technical implementation, through the lens of that budget. And if something causes you to exceed that budget, whether it's a new uh, graphic, a new weight of font, or a new JavaScript library, then it needs to be a moment to pause as that team actually talks about what the value of that element is if it's going to negatively impact your bottom line from a performance standpoint. So the other thing that I really love is not just tech technical implementations, but revisiting old ideas that I think are really relevant to the web today. And one of them is, beyond anything else, very critical for designing responsibly, which is this idea of designing for progressive enhancement, of designing to ensure that there's access to the content or to the transaction, independent of the experience around it. And this has been at the heart of every responsive design that's been launched at scale over the last couple years. The BBC have been experimenting with responsive design in public for about two years. They just launched their new responsive news experience online. And it's a beautiful piece of work. Aesthetically speaking, it's incredibly fast, it's very flexible, and it is a wonderful ca uh, use case for responsive design. But the way in which they built this is actually kind of interesting. Because if you spend any amount of time with this experience on a, uh, on a reasonably new device, you're going to see a whole bunch of really interesting little UI niceties, like expandable menus, tabs that actually um, toggle different content, secondary stories that have thumbnails. But on less capable browsers and devices like this one, those uh, expandable menus are simply skip links that bring you down to the bottom of the document where the menu resides natively. Those uh, secondary stories don't actually have images associated with them. Those are seen as enhancements, not core content. And those tabs are actually just links to the proper URIs where that content resides natively, which is then fetched in on more uh, enhanced devices. So in other words, what they've done is kind of designed two same ex uh, similar experiences for that same uh, responsive UI. 
there's a baseline experience that's incredibly fast and flexible that's served universally, but then a more enhanced one that's conditionally served up to the other ones. Now, the real thing I love about this is how they actually describe which version you actually get, which is a process they call cutting the mustard. Does your browser cut the mustard, sir? This is my new favorite phrase. And I think every time I ask that question in public, I'm never actually going to be invited back to the UK. But uh, <laughs> what they're doing is just committing to load enough code in the UI to see if the device or the browser can actually benefit from further assets, from more, uh, more code. So they basically are just doing a simple feature check to see if the browser is sufficiently modern enough by BBC standards. And if it passes that test, then great. They bootstrap the UI with additional CSS and with JavaScript to pull in some of those more enhanced UI elements. But if it fails that test, or if the JavaScript never reaches the end user, then they're still left with an incredibly fast and flexible UI that can be viewed on any device on the planet. In other words, for the BBC and for other large-scale organizations that are designing responsibly, progressive enhancement is a great way to let go, but not irresponsibly. What they're doing is designing an experience that can live on two broad tiers from a UI standpoint. And they can basically let go of tracking individual browsers and devices and you know, different platform-specific bugs and actually just focus on whether or not any given browser actually receives that top-line experience. And they're able to do so without sacrificing aesthetics or speed. And I think it's a beautiful example of this. And other experiences that I've worked on have actually used this. I mean, editorially did something similar. There was a similar mustard cutting check um, to basically just sort of see if you could benefit from those more enhanced elements like modal overlays or tool tips. But if you failed that test, there was still an underlying um, UI that was completely usable. In other words, this, uh, this version of the uh, UI that focus those little niceties, like edit this document tool tips, or modal overlays for specific transactions. If you failed that test, or if the code never reached your browser, you were still left with something that actually had just simple titles on links that were still accessible to the end user. Or those links to those modal overlays were actually just following to a separate URI where the form actually lived by default. And then we could enhance up from that baseline experience. The benefit, at least for me, from a progressive enhancement standpoint is that it's a defensive mechanism, right? It's really primed for the instability of the web as a delivery mechanism. Between the user requesting our page, downloading our JavaScript, and parsing and executing it, I mean any number of things can fail. And by thinking more responsibly and also more resiliently, we can build up from a baseline experience that's served to everyone and then give them something in the browser. Because, I mean, historically, I mean, JavaScript-only app applications are incredibly fragile. This happened to me on Twitter a few months ago, or actually about a year ago now, where basically I was presented with a completely blank screen after I logged in because there wasn't actually any content in the document. Some parsing error had sort of slipped into the feed somewhere, and so this was effectively what I was left with on a slow, spotty, high-latency connection. But that bootstrapping, that mustard cutting, doesn't necessarily just need to happen at the UI level. It can also happen for individual components. We did the same sort of thing for, uh, for Editorially's editor, where there was a check once you actually came into the document to see if you supported some of the features like content editable or the get selection API to basically sort of figure out if you could actually be sort of served up that richer experience. And if you pass that test, that's great. You were left with this full, uh, fully featured uh, UI. But if you failed that test, how do you actually provide access to that word, to those words and to that content? Well, the nice thing is, is there's actually a really wonderful element in HTML that allows you to do long form editing, which is specifically a text area. So this is what the editor was natively, and then if you pass that test, you would enhance up from there. Now, that's not to say that uh, progressive enhancement is the only answer to all of our challenges. Um, I don't think there's ever going to be just one simple answer. But in more of the work that I do, I'm just kind of reminded of the fact that designing for the web and developing for the web is lossy. When we cater an experience to somebody, we're surrendering so much control over the quality of their network, the capabilities of their device, and the design that we deliver to them should actually reflect that. Our design practices and our development practices can embrace that flexibility and that uncertainty. And this has been the hallmark of every great designer in history. I mean, the Eameses, who were some of the preeminent designers in the middle of the 20th century, had this one wonderful uh, piece of uh, moment in their career where they're designing some of the best furniture available to the average American consumer for the very first time. And they made it affordable. There was this air of functionalism throughout all of their work, but it was still breathtaking. And they made it affordable because they utilized low-cost materials like fiberglass or aluminum or plastic, things that were kind of derided and looked down upon by a lot of their competitors. But their work wasn't just hidden behind some clever upholstery. It framed the design. 
It was the design. And there's this quote that I love by Ray Eames, who said that what works is better than what looks good. The looks good can change, but what works, works. I love that line. Because I think we're at this point now, as we were designing for more devices and more contexts than ever before, we need a new definition of beautiful as it applies to the web. You know, one in which our success is defined by how broadly our work is accessed, not just how aesthetically appealing it might be or how rich the interactions are. And the wonderful thing is, is that there are so many sites out there combining responsive design with these lightweight materials to reduce the size of their footprint, to broaden their reach, to reach more people than ever before and more devices. Now, these sites aren't the norm just yet. But I think they show we can deliver content and functionality, even the baseline devices, and then intelligently chart a path up to that higher end. We can design and build such wonderful, beautiful things, you guys. So yes, we are absolutely builders. We are designers. We are developers. But we're also, maybe more importantly, map makers. We are cartog cartographers. We're capable not just of outlining a landscape, but also reshaping it as we see fit with every project that we launch, with every tool that we build. That's an awesome responsibility, but it's also an incredible gift. And so as we leave this amazing room in this fantastic zoo in the heart of this beautiful city I hope to come back to at some point, you know, let's begin sketching a new map of the web together. One that outlines a web designed for reach, accessible by all, no matter what part of the world they might live in. With that, I would like to thank you very much for your time.